Cool. I'm going to pace around because I'm really cold. Um, I came, I didn't know it was going to be cold up here in the north. How did that happen? Um, so, yeah, Wesson, if you're listening, this is the silver bullet talk. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, there's no, I don't think there's such a thing. So, yeah, thank you. My, my story, like so many, I had no idea that this would be the case, but my story starts, you know, on the water in a, in a canoe. Um, and I'm, you know, my wife and I, January or June 26, 2011, are out, you know, on this, on this nice lake canoeing in the morning in New Mexico. And um, all of a sudden we see this big plume kind of coming off on the distance. And I knew that there was a fire burning in the area, um, in the, in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, which are sort of east of Santa Fe. And I kept telling her, oh, that's the, that's the, the Pacheco fire was the name of that fire. And she says, no, it looks like it's coming from the Jemez Mountains, which is where, where we were living. And, um, you know, I said, no, no, listen, I, like, I, I know about this kind of stuff, you know, <laughs> you don't got to tell me what to do. And so we're in this, you know, we're canoeing and it's like three foot waves and there's two, like I learned, you know, we've since got married and stuff and she's awesome. And I've learned <laughs> that um, there's two types of people, there's two types of couples. There's couples that can canoe together and then there's couples that get kayaks. And so we've got two kayaks now and it's really nice. But so we're going home and we realize like, oh yeah, it is coming from, it is coming from, um, you know, the Jemez Mountains. And, you know, that day is, is really the start of um, my work in, in, for, in, in fire. And it really was the, was the birth of the Rio Grande Water Fund, even though we really didn't fully launch until 2014, three years later. This picture was taken outside of, of our house. And at that point, she decided that she was going to evacuate. And we were, you know, we were living um, on, you know, meager park service salaries at the time. And so as we kind of rolled into town, we see this plume building up. And so we had a roommate and we're, my wife, Jamie and I are talking about what we're going to take. And we had a dog. And so we're like, oh, get the dog food and, you know, get some clothes and some sleeping bags and stuff because who knows where we're going to be and it's it's pretty clear that we're going to get evacuated when you drive up on a scene like this and um our roommate at the time bless her heart she had you know been on a sunday brunch and probably had one or two many mimosas and comes running out the house as we're pulling up with all of the toilet paper like running down the street i'm like we'll probably be okay um <laughs> So anyway, so my wife packs up the house, you know, or not the house, but, you know, packs up enough stuff to, to live for a week and um, throws a dog in the truck and, and drives down the hill towards Santa Fe. And I drive towards the fire. And as, as two kids from Iowa, that's a, that's a trippy experience. And we got in and a couple of days later, I was able to make a phone call and found out that she was, she was staying with a couple people and um, visited her one night and they were all up at, you know, midnight eating pizza, drinking margaritas, having a good time, you know, and, and that's the kind of stuff where you realize the importance of community and the, how we're, we're not able to do this alone. I think that Darren kicked off the, you know, the conference with that kind of sentiment that we all need to collaborate. We need to come together and, you know, essentially what we're doing in that situation is building community. And that's one thing I want to emphasize with this talk. But before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about just the ecological effects of fires like the Los Conchas fire. And so again, this is um, 2011. And this fire burned 40,000 acres in the first day. And it really left behind areas that essentially looked moonscape. Many of you have probably seen photos from this or experienced, you know, your own fires. The Haman fire is another fire that did similar effects. I mean, this is burning in areas, pinion juniper, that we thought were, you know, completely inflammable. People are calling this the asbestos woodland. It's hard to believe that these, these areas are burning. And we're seeing this disturbance really start to ramp up. So what I'm showing you here is the Jemez Mountains. And this is in sort of north, it's northwest of Santa Fe. 
And Bandelier National Monument is called out there, and for scale, it's about 30,000 acres. So the red on the map is just the high severity fire, so just the tree killing fire, which we, we know is anomalous in the historic record of Bandelier, or of this particular area in New Mexico. So this is the 70s. We had one fire in the 70s, and again, it's about 17,000 acres, huge, made the news, burned onto Los Alamos National Lab. The 80s were relatively wet, so we didn't have that many fires. In the 90s, we added a couple more. This area here is Santa Clara Canyon. So Santa Clara Canyon, the, the actual Pueblo and the village site is here, and the, the Pueblo had been doing a lot of work to, to restore their areas. If you, um, if you ever have a chance to talk with anybody from Santa Clara, that's a, that's a pretty sad story. Um, 2000s, we add a couple, we add more high severity fire. Again, this is the Cerro Grande fire. Cerro Grande was a prescribed fire that was lit by the Park Service. Um, for those of you that are, were around it, definitely made the news. Um, it burned onto the lab, burned 160 homes in, in the town of Los Alamos. Coincidentally, ironically, whatever you want to say, it actually saved Los Alamos from the Las Conchas fire. So this is the Los Conchas fire, 153,000 acres, 40,000 acres here on day one. 18 hours from a power line falling on, or an aspen falling on a power line and running to that. This is in the early days of Twitter. And so when you could still get a text message with every tweet. And so I had it set up to like send a text and you, I got one from the, from the forest and it said, 41, you know, 43,000 some, some 865 acres, something like that, you know, so it was down to the actual acre. So it was a really precise number, but I'm looking at it and I'm saying, there's, there's no way that that's true, right? I know things about this. They can, that can't happen. And you come to find out that, yeah, it had just, I mean, ash and stuff has fallen down as you're reading this thing in the morning. So just sort of bananas um, in terms of fire behavior. And what we realized then and there is that the pace of the disturbance is far outweighing our, our, our pace of intervention. And we're treating approximately 3,000 acres a year across the entire sort of upper Rio Grande Basin at the time. And that's, you know, 30 minutes on a fire like that. And we really start to say, um, when you look down into that high severity area, not only is it you know kind of devastating from the aerial view, but you look at its impacts to watershed, and this is you know very similar to some of the other talks. But you take a creek like this after a quarter inch of rain, and you start to see it; it's bank full, and this is miles away from the actual fire footprint itself. After ha after an inch of rain, you start to get um, literally the the Rio Grande running through some of these small canyons, all full of ash, debris, sediment. Um, let's see if we can get this to work. So this is a video, some of you may have seen it, of um, Cochiti Canyon coming down. And it's about two minutes, I'll just let it play. This is, this is 2011, so this is a couple months after the fire. This is a small flood. There, in 2013, there was the big flood. So, I mean, this creek is, you know, this normally runs at maybe 250 CFS in August, around the same time, and this is after an inch and a half of rain. And so it completely wiped out road access to this, this orchard here was a, you know, this time of year, apple picking was a family event. People would go in, that orchard's no longer there. Um, the road access is gone. The orchard's been wiped out. Um, the downstream of this is um, an area that looks similar to this. So it's moving tons, literally tons of sediment estimates for this particular area 
which is right at the, it's at the mouth of one of the canyons that flows into the Rio Grande is the main stem there. 70 feet of sediment in that area. So when we talk about catastrophic fire in New Mexico, we're really taught, we really are using catastrophic fire as a proxy for the flood events which follow because of the way that our fire season is followed by our monsoon season. And those are the, that's the double whammy of disturbance that we have in New Mexico. And that's what we're trying to prevent. We're trying to prevent scenes like this, which is Cochiti Reservoir, which is above stream of some of the municipal drinking water sources. When you start pulling water out of our drinking water, that, or water out of our rivers for drinking water that looks like this, it becomes unusable from the municipal uh, water, you know, you can't clean that basically. And so you have to shut down your water intakes. And, you know, Alan Hook from the city of Santa Fe is gonna talk tomorrow about more of this, but you can, you can see that there's an economic cost right away to shutting down what's, the, what's our cheapest, cleanest source of drinking water is the stuff that comes out of our rivers and out of our mountains. And when you have to shut it down and pump from the groundwater, you're starting to add cost. And again, this is a, just to reiterate, the pace of the disturbance, the, the anomalous climate change driven disturbance is outrunning by order of magnitude our ability to intervene. So in 2014, we launched the, the Rio Grande Water Fund. And just for a little bit of context, the, the, water, the Rio Grande Water Fund covers the upper basin of the, of the Rio Grande um, that includes just south of Albuquerque, a small town called Belen, and it's in you know, northern New Mexico. And for those of you who haven't been to New Mexico, I really encourage you to come visit us. We've got the mountains of Colorado without the people. We've got the geology of um, Utah with better beer. And uh, we've got you know, the canyons of Arizona without the RVs. Um, it's not totally true, we got a lot of Texans. Um, so the, the, this, this, so the, the goal here, six, 600,000 acres over 20 years is 30,000 acres a year, right? And um, that goal was not set as some arbitrary stretch goal. That's actually looking at all of the area that we classify as dry conifer in the waterfront footprint, and then taking that down and saying, if we treat half of that, which is what scientists are kind of are, are telling us that we need to treat in order to allow fire to play its natural role, we get down to this 600,000 acre number. Um, we really think that the other piece that's important is number, it, all of this is important, but the thing that we were doing that was new was this new mechanism for collaboration, coordination, and really trying to bring in funding. And then we'll get into how we've been successful at some of at the other two goals. Um, in just a bit. So the water fund, and, and this is kind of going back to um, some of what Abby was talking about earlier, it's, it's based on, it, it gives people a framework to tell, to tell a good story and tell an important story about how our mountains are connected to our economy, to our livelihoods, to our downstream users, and it does it in a way that helps talk about the problem. And so our problem is we have too much trees, we need to thin it out. A co-benefit of thinning those trees is we get wood product, we get jobs, you know, that creates a pathway for water to get down into our communities and our water users downstream. It gets used along the way for agriculture, some of our oldest you know, communities in North America still live in the same place for thousands of years, use that water for agriculture, we're using it for recreation, we're using it for, um, the wildlife is using it, we're using that as a way to get into um, more recreation, keep that sort of recreation, restoration, economy thinning, and at the end of the day, we're reducing the risk of catastrophic wildfire, while reintroducing healthy, good fire and letting fire play its natural role in the system. 
So again, just to remind you of our goals, um, the two I've highlighted here are the, are the quantitative ones that we wanted to focus on. So 30,000 acres a year and 21 million in funding. And again, this is, this is the entire sort of footprint of all of these diverse land management agencies together. Um, last year, we hit that goal of 30,000 acres, actually more. Just got the numbers in literally today, this, this morning, we're at 30,000 again. So two years in a row, we've hit that 30,000 acre goal, which is, which is huge. And we're doing it mostly through prescribed fire and managed natural fire. So our cost per acre is actually a lot lower. We're not, when we do thinning projects, yeah, we're, we have some that are in the $2,500 an acre range, but when you start to put those in a strategic place that then allow you to, to create a catcher's mitt, you can, you can allow managed fire to move into that area and protect your homes and communities a lot cheaper. We're hitting more or less our, our funding goals this year we were at about 18, so that's public and private um, funding leveraged, you know, combined together for some of this for some of this work. And all the while we're doing this, we're completely um, led by and informed by science. So whether it's at the you know the place based watershed level, you can't get more place based than a tree. And so looking at the, the fire history and of a specific place, or if we're zooming out and looking at the whole watershed, we're trying to scale that to a specific collaboration. So just to switch gears for just into talking about collaboration and coalition building, we will use the, the Taos Valley Watershed Coalition as a model. And here's um, uh, an example of just after you take this footprint of a of an area, you can. Sorry, I'm going back and forth. Um, you combine the the science that's informing where the treatments are going to be most effective to reduce that risk to the the water quality and the watershed health, and then you combine that with the agency priorities, the you know, this, the multiple stakeholder priorities and the actual feasibility, you get something that looks like this where you're identifying a, a footprint with projects loaded onto it that's backed up by a coalition. And then you get into this, like, then you get somebody up here saying something crazy where money is not the limiting factor in any, in any of this. In New Mexico, in New Mexico is a poor state. Money is not the limiting factor. If you add up collective will plus strategic, smart, science-informed thinking, that's the, that's the formula to hook the money hose. And you can actually get into a small area like the community of Taos, $1.8 million invested in that, in that area because of that collaborative and because of that strategic planning. And that leads to real tangible outcomes on the ground. And like I said, we can't do this alone. I'm gonna ch challenge somebody to count and make sure we have 83 up here. But these are the signatories of the water fund. So we have diverse partners from private industry to uh, healthcare, uh, providers to ski valleys to counties to federal agencies it's it's really great and we've been successful too at looking at our um, at our legislative priorities we've been able to pass um, statewide legislation that if you read through it looks a lot like the water fund where diverse coalition of people are coming together to fund upstream forest restoration to protect watershed health and through this whole process, we've learned a lot. It is a, it is a thing, it's a real, money may not be the limiting factor, but it's a really hard thing to actually manage. And this is something that like, I was talking to a buddy of mine and he says, who does similar work, and he's like, we should have had like sociology and uh, business degrees, not environmental science and forestry, like none of those, that, that didn't help me at all. And so, 
the, the managing of the financial systems is, is really a challenge. The capacity, again, coming back to this, you can't do it alone. We need help. You, we have been working really hard to develop the capacity with our local partners. And it's, um, it's one of the most rewarding and one of the most challenging things that we do is to go into a local community, provide them with a model similar to the Taos Valley Watershed Coalition and say, how can we stand something up in your area, you know, given that you've got, you've got pro, um, you know, you're dealing with, education systems that, that are failing your youth, your, your, your kids are leaving, your you know, X, Y, and Z, there's a bunch of other stuff going on. How do we help, how do we go into a community, understand their needs and put our conservation values underneath those instead of come in and say, hey, we've got a conservation idea, how can you kind of stick your stuff underneath it? Monitoring has been really important. I think that we've done a good job generally of well, we've done an okay job generally of monitoring our ecological effects. You know, I think that treatment effectiveness and, and prescribed fire effectiveness has been something that we've studied and we've monitored really well. We're starting to get a really, we're starting to get better um, at monitoring our social impacts and our social sort of, um, the social changes and how do we create more fire adapted communities like one of my colleagues says, uh, there's not a problem in the world that can't be solved by putting a social scientist on it, and I fully embrace that. So all the social scientists out there, there's tons of projects to work on in this footprint, and that kind of leads into this, you know, engagement with stakeholder groups has been has been really key. So as we look into kind of the future, um, we're looking at how do we continue to engage our, um, how do we continue to build the restoration economy in the waterfront footprint? How do we continue to engage um, in these burned areas through, you know, a series of, um, sorry, I'm gonna skip that one. These, these burned areas that are not recovering after catastrophic fires, what, how do we do that in a way that's, that's holistic? How do we do that in a way that engages communities? How do we do that in a way that mimics natural processes? Where do, where do we need to supplement some um, small reforestation efforts? Um, unfortunately, you know, no matter what we do, no matter how successful we are, the areas of high severity fire are gonna continue to increase and the areas of sort of green trees are gonna to continue to decrease. And so this sort of effort, thinking about what's next, thinking about what comes next is gonna be critical. And then again, coming back to this idea of managed fire, how do we create systems that allow fire to play a natural role where we can take a natural ignition, allow it to do, to do its own thing, let nature be the decider so that we're not gardening out there and choosing, you know, which lives and dies. That's an economic reality, I think, for us. And it's just, it's a, it's a system that allows um, nature to play that keystone process and fire to play that keystone process in the landscape. And we've seen some success with that, with engaging across boundaries, engaging across forest boundaries, getting forest, you know, forest to forest conversations, forest to neighbor conversations happening where we can pre-plan and say, if we get a fire in this particular area, we've already thought about it and we're gonna kind of let it go provided that these conditions exist. And that's the kind of stuff where we can, we can really start to learn how to, to live with fire. And we've seen it work, right? We've seen these thinned areas where the, the big raging fire comes through, it hits the ground, it, it burns in this really healthy, healthy landscape, recycles those nutrients. These are just three, three fires from our local, our local area. And the reality is that New Mexico is in, is this like, this to me is, is terrifying. The only, the, the only other um, country that gets, us, that gets a score that's higher than New Mexico is Qatar. 
And it's like, I don't think anybody's ever said Qatar and New Mexico in the same sentence before. And so we're, we're looking at, you know, uh, a water risk that's as high as, um, so the, the challenges are, are immense. And um, I think that the next five years, we're going to be kind of operating under that landscape where we're we're always sort of have that risk in the rear view mirror and so I'll just leave this up here and um, yeah open it up for questions thanks a lot Colin we do have a few minutes for questions Yeah, it's, I think that that's like, it's different each, that's where it's really important to have sort of a, a watershed based approach. And so it's different for each watershed group. So there's, um, in Taos, we went in with all of these different maps. So we said, here's, here's where we think you should work. Here's where the science is telling us that we should, that we should work sort of done, had done like a little bit of a, a risk assessment and that kind of stuff. And the community was really like, we don't we we appreciate that but we also we also have such a strong ecological knowledge that we're going to draw our own circles and so they drew their own circles and then we went and then we took those and overlaid where they thought the best treatment areas were and then refine those refine those prioritizations based on the science so we went in kind of like in an iterative process that way. And then in Santa Fe, people were really like, we want to be completely science-based. And so we've done a lot of risk assessment. We've done a lot of work to identify those priority areas and then over and then go to the, the management agencies and say, okay, how will you draw, you know, your um, how will you draw the polygons for where you'd like to start? Your treatment efforts on it on that particular landscape. So it's it's really case by case, and it's really dependent. And I think that the prior there's a lot of really great risk assessment stuff that helps set the framework that um, Dave Culkin and and others are working on. But for me, it's nine times out of ten you get smart people in the room with magic markers and, and they're gonna be the ones, they're gonna come out just as good as the, or better than the computer does. And it's all about, to me, it's like at the end of the day, what you want is a priority map that people trust. And so you have to kind of, you have to tailor your process to the community in a way that you'll end up with a result that's usable. Because even if it's totally right and unusable, it doesn't matter. One more quick question. Sweet. All right, let's move on. 